We're 103 now. Hello everyone, hello mum, hello dad. Everyone's saying it's sideways now. Yeah. You missed it up, Ash. No. Did you know? No, nah, it's still saying it's sideways. Sorry about the cameraman, he's just been sacked. There we go. So what we're going to do this week, I'm going to kind of take you through the homebrew process. Um, not too in-depth, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a different few things. Uh, the ash was definitely sacked. Um, sacked in the morning. And then I'll take you through each step, which basically is the same as what we talked about last week and the same process as, as what we've done. So we'll start off. What I'm going to do, I'm going to jump straight in because Brewing, whether it's brewing on this sort of system or it's home brewing, takes a lot of time. It can take you up to about, I don't know, best part of six to eight hours to get a brew done. So it's going to be a bit blue peter today where it's going to be a lot of, this is what we prepared earlier. And um, yeah, I'm just going to jump straight in to the mash tun. So what we're going to do, and the reason why I want to do this is because this takes about 30 minutes. So I can talk more about the process than uh, about what we're doing after that. So the first thing I'm going to do is that I'm just going to add our water. Now, this is pretty hot, so I've just taken this from our hot liquor tank, so it's at the right temperature, so I'm hoping we hit all our temperatures right, and I'll talk about why temperatures are so important a bit later. So this is where I'm going to get my glamorous assistant Alex to come in and um, he's going to start pouring the grain. But the first thing what I want to talk about is we talked about the water last week and how important water is and its composition and what we're trying to achieve. So today we're doing a bit of a mock-up. We're trying to brew uh, Club Tropicana and it's the same recipe, the same grain. So if you want to take a look at the grain just in there, this has all been crushed and um, weighed out, we're about five kilos of grain in there and it's all ready to go. Now what we're also looking at is these salts that we talked about um, last week. We're just gonna stick them straight in, just like that. And I'll talk more about that. I just wanna keep this temperature right. So what I'm gonna do is if you wanna grab the big spoon. Yep, this is my camera assistant, <laughs> Alex. Um, and we're gonna to start to pour this in and this is what's called mashing in. And this is what the porridge sort of consistency that we're looking for is about. This is obviously a little bit quicker than what it takes. This takes about 30 minutes to mash in on our bigger system. It'll probably take about a couple of minutes just here now. So I put about 20 litres of water in, 15 to 20 litres. We've got about five kilo of grain. So I put a little bit more water in than I actually needed. Usually we go about 
2.7, uh, 2.5 to 2.7 litres of water per kilo of grain. So, so we're just giving it a good mash. So can you see inside? So it is like that sort of porridge uh, mixture like you get in the morning, I suppose. Thank you, Alex. Top job. You can be brewer tomorrow. Um, Alex is in our, he, Alex is our local sales guy and um, he's busy at the moment with the online shop and uh, so he's never brewed before, right Alex? That's right. Yeah. You can get a job tomorrow though with this. So a good mix is very important because you don't want any lumps sort of flocking together because you're not going to get out of it what you need to get out of it. You need to get all those lumps broken up. It smells awesome. It always reminds me of Horlicks. Something like that anyway. Not that I drink much Horlicks. I think Alex does. You like a bit of Horlicks for bedtime? Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. No, we're not using our own. Um, we're kind of going off kilt today. Um, that was a heavy. We do use quite a lot of water treatments here because we have very, very soft water. So we need those different. Um, uh, that heavy addition of the calcium chloride and calcium sulfate to get the desired results. So that is all mixed in now, and we've got to get the lid on because it's super important that we get the right temperatures. So in she goes. And I'll talk about more about the salts and things like that once I get this set up. And I hope I hit the right temperatures. Big test. So last week, if anybody bought the packs, uh, the tasting packs on the virtual brewery tour, you would have been tasting the wort, which was made in this. I done the exact same thing last week, um, and that is what we're going to get out of this. So usually this takes around 45 minutes. We'll probably go down to around 20 minutes because obviously we haven't got all night to be doing it, and you'll get pretty bored um, waiting around. So temperature-wise, yeah, spot on. We've hit 67 degrees, which is absolutely spot on for what we're looking at. Now, the reason why the temperature is so important is because um, we had a question come in earlier um, from Paul Reed over in Bristol, who was looking to get into um, home brewing, and um, he asked how important is the temperatures that you need inside this mash tun. But it's super important, Paul, because if the temperature goes too high, then you end up with um, a, a very overly sweet, thick mixture, and the, the yeast can't ferment all the different sugars in there. So you'll end up the beer will be very sweet and cloying. If it was too low temperature, let's say 62 degrees and under, 64 maybe, the beer can end up a little bit too thin and with the wrong sweetness. So it's really critical. We always aim for around sort of 65 to about 68, depending on what we're after in the beer. So we've hit spot on there on um, 66 and a half, I think. So that's perfect. So we'll wait for that. Mo's just said it's just a GLC episode or the home brewing episode. Why is it a GLC? <laughs> well, because of my jacket. <laughs> Cheeky. Right, now this is the part where the brewer comes in, he mashes in first of all, then he'll come in at five in the morning and he goes straight to the canteen for a cup of tea and has his nap for about an hour. Um, they don't really, but um, they will go make a cup of tea while this is mashing in. Um, the biggest thing with brewing and home brewing is patience, and things take time. Patience uh, and cleaning. So kind of that's what it is. So I'm going to have a beer. So I don't know about you guys if you're having a beer, but if you are, cheers. So hey, neck and nominate. Um, so yeah, um, it's been really busy the last week. Again, thanks very much for the all the support on the shop. It's gone. Uh, it's still doing really well. We've had a crazy day today. We have released um, two new beers. Um, stay put. Uh, now the reason why we've done these, obviously, because people need to be staying put in their houses and uh, isolating. And we've done a raspberry ripple marshmallow porter and a mint chocolate chip marshmallow porter. Uh, they were one-offs. So we actually canned them yesterday because I was on the canning line trying to help out. And all the proceeds are going to go to the NHS. That was the idea behind it. Um, you know, we're doing our own hand sanitizer and bits like that. That we, you know, we'll talk about more later in the week or beginning of the next week. And we thought to give something back to the NHS for the, you know, the amazing job that they're doing, but all the proceeds from this, and we've had various um, people helping us out, like the can suppliers and things, and literally we made 16,000 cans, so 8,000 cans of each. 
and they kind of crashed the website today. As soon as we released them, crashed the website, and they literally sold within about, I don't know, maybe four yeah. hours. It was something crazy anyway. So we've raised, we're, we're hoping to raise over 30,000 pounds. So every bit of, you know, everything that went into these beers, it'll all go. The money that people spend on them, it's all gonna go to the NHS. So, you know, we're looking at 30,000 pounds. So that's amazing. So thanks very much for that. I think there might be a little bit of the raspberry one left on, on, on online. Um, I'm not sure. There was a couple of boxes left earlier. It's probably all gone, but yeah, awesome. Thanks very much for that. So, let's get back into the brewing. So obviously, uh, we use the, the grain that we're looking at, that grain that went in there. You all saw it last week, but if you didn't see it, there it is in its finest form. This is pale malt, so British grown, um, best malt in the world as well, in my opinion, but hey. Um, we then obviously have to crush it. It didn't look like that. We crushed it. And the reason why we crush these grains is because it's like a coffee bean. If you didn't crush a coffee bean, you're not gonna get much out of it, in all honesty. So we have to crush it to get out the sugars that we're looking for. Now inside this malted barley is lots of starches. And we have to change that starch into sugar. Now the process around that is that it gets malted at the monsters, um, so it starts to germinate. They dry it out, so that enzyme reaction is started and then it's finished. When they dry it out, it gets sent to us, we crush it. So the reason why that water temperature is so important is because we have to change those starches into sugars. And that's exactly what's happening inside this mash tun now, or these big mash tuns you can see behind you. So it's exactly the same thing, the same science that's happening. So to get the sugars out of it and the flavors that we're looking for can take up to anything up to 30 minutes to one hour. Um, there's ways of checking if that conversion hasn't happened and there's still starch in it. You can take a bit of grain out, put a bit of iodine with it, um, uh, and you can test if there's any starch left in it. So we usually mash for about 45 minutes. If we're doing a very, very strong beer, we can mash up to about easily 60 minutes, maybe 75 minutes to make sure we're getting all those sugars out that we, uh, that we need. Yes. So, yeah. So we've just got a question on that subject there, saying uh, how finely do you crush them all before uh, any particular way? Well, yeah, I mean, I, mean, I mean, that is super important because what you don't want to do is have lots of grains going through that are not crushed. You're just wasting malt then. Um, you don't want it too powdery. If you have it too powdery, what happens is that you can block your mash tuns up um, and it's not great. So. I'll give you a good um, indication now. We got mash sort of um, grain filters that we can make sure. So as you can see there, it's a good crush. It's not too powdery. Um, there's not many whole kernels in there. You don't want to be seeing whole kernels because you're just wasting it. So a, a good coarse crush, enough to get out of it what you need. So perfect. Right. So that enzymic reaction is happening within this mash tun right now. As I said, it can take about 45 minutes. And what we're going to do, um, I've done a little sample earlier, but what I don't want to do is talk about too much nerdy stuff. Um, if any, anybody wants to ask any questions, that's absolutely fine, not a problem. But um, I'll talk a bit more about how we started up, and because we are home brewers, me and Brad uh, set the business up eight years ago, basically. But 10 years ago, we were home brewing. Uh, I had a huge influence through my granddad, who was a home brewer. He's still home brewing now, and he's in his late 80s. He's self-isolated and everybody's got plenty of beer. Um, but I had my, I got my first interest in homebrewing through, through him, uh, through going up there as a kid basically, and then obviously running around the house. And I can always remember going into his garage and the place just stinking of, of beer, I suppose, stale beer. And we used to have, um, we used to make bottles of ginger beer. I always remember as a kid. And he'd make the, the, the little ginger plant the yeast, the ginger powder, and keep feeding it every day with sugar. And then we put it into um, he put it into a big two liter bottle, um, add the water, and we kind of let it ferment. And I can always remember that the bottle expanded every day as it, as, it, as it kind of gained more carbonation. And I'd have to kind of do it, um, undo it every day because the bottle, I, I was six, seven at the time. It was, I, I think it was non-alcoholic, I hope it was. Um, but I was just fascinated by the by it blowing up and it was great fun and I, I just got into it through that and he used to do all his own wine, um, he used to do his own spirits I think as well back then. But I think people were home brewing sort of 40 years ago because um, the beer was expensive maybe and it's not like that anymore so home brewing has become, 
I, I suppose, much more of a hobby than a, a necessity. But he always, had, you know, he loved it doing it as a, as a hobby. And like, I always remember a story my dad told me that um, he bottled some beer too early once. And um, if you bottle beer too early, you, you're going to end up with problems with exploding bottles. And he said he can remember one night that um, he heard a huge bang downstairs in the kitchen. And literally one of the bottles had, had exploded and taken off the cupboard door, the kitchen cupboard door. So it's, you know, it can be really dangerous when you get it wrong, especially with glass bottles. But um, I can remember going up at his house and he'd keep his yeast just like this on the fireplace to keep it nice and warm. Uh, we keep it cold now these days, but um, yeah, you just, it, the, I mean, the whole house just smelt of yeast and, um, and kind of beer and malt and things. And it, it was absolutely fantastic. And I just had a big interest from it from that age. And then obviously, as I got a bit older and um, I, I homebrew a little bit more, and I've got these books, you know, some great books that I'll talk about. I mean, this was one of my grandfather's books, one of his homebrew books that he gave me. The dog actually chewed the end of it, but um, it's great. It's got some old, really old recipes in there. And um, I'll talk through one of the recipes later because it's absolutely bizarre. But it's great, it's just a, um, it's just a fantastic hobby to have and it's dead interesting. It doesn't have to be about beer either. As I said, my granddad was making loads of different wines and country wines and things and you'd have a little deal with the, the local market that um, the market guy would, on a Saturday afternoon, drop down any fruit that was kind of going off or, you know, just wasn't fit for sale. And um, he said um, he'd swap fruit um, for bits of wine. So what he used to do, um, was just make these wines up, I suppose. And, you know, you can make so many different things. And this book is all about it as well. Again, it's the same guy. And it's got the ginger beer in there. And you can make all your own Irish creams. And, I, you know, advocate of Christmas. And it's, yeah, it's good. And it's fun. And that's what it's all about. It's just having fun. And you can take it as seriously as you want to take it. But it's all about having fun. So um, one of the questions I got emailed earlier was about someone who wanted to start home brewing. But, um, didn't know where to start and it is quite daunting when you don't know where to start so what we I emailed him you know my sort of favorite book where I got a lot of influence from sort of 12 years ago and it's a book called British Real Ale it doesn't sound very exciting but it's a fantastic book by a, um, a guy called Graham Wheeler who's a home brewer um, he's uh, sadly passed away now but it's a great book and if anybody wants to get into brewing it's a good basic book get to the sort of knowledge going and um, yeah, if anybody wants the link, they'll send the link later. So when you first started brewing gas, how did you sort of find ways to crush your own, your own grain and malt at home? Well, you can buy, that's a good question because we crush our own grain because it's obviously a lot cheaper to buy in bulk when it's whole, but for home brewers and things like that, you can buy pre-crushed malt, so it's all crushed for you. You know, there's so many different ways you can brew. You don't have to brew like this, we call this all grain brewing. So this is the, the kind of full setup. Um, it can be a bit daunting if someone's looking to get into home brewing. And to be honest, I wouldn't advise to start here. Personally, I go out to Wilkinson's, maybe like that, only if it's necessary. And um, pick up one of the kits. You can buy everything in there, you can buy a kit. At least you get the basics right then. And then, you know, do a couple of them and just work your way up. The most important thing is to enjoy it and having fun and not getting bogged down in all these you know, little details and things, that will just come with more experience and sort of research, yeah, so. Oh, people are sort of wondering how sort of expensive it is to sort of begin, you know, brewing at home and sort of garage brewing and this. Yeah, I think, again, start with the basics. I always say start with the basics and all you're gonna need is a plastic bucket, that's the most important thing. Uh, you'll get your little tin. Uh, we were doing homebrew kits, crutch homebrew kits, um, and it comes in a syrup. So basically, this liquid that we're making inside here, you can get it in a, in, a, in a syrup form or a powder form. And basically, you can mix that with hot water, uh, put it into the bucket. As I said, Wilkinson's are doing those kits. There's plenty of others. There's really good websites out there, like the Malt Miller. Fantastic. If you're, ever, you know, if you're really into your own brewing, or even just getting into it, Robert the Malt Miller is amazing, and he's got some awesome stuff. So check that out. Um, yeah, bucket, a lid and just the ingredients then. But when you want to bottle it, you might need, obviously, you need empty bottles and just some piping and siphoning it out. So it is pretty easy, it's not difficult. Um, so yeah, it's a great hobby and it obviously, patience is key, but um, yeah. Any other questions? 
Um, yeah, so I was wondering sort of like the grist process. What is the grist? Right, well, what the grist is, as, as, as we put in there earlier, and Ash showed the malt. So what we call the grist, because there's, di there's many different types of malt. You know, this is pale malt, and this is what we majority use, but there's others we talked about last week, like crystal malt and caramel malt, darker malts. So you might have something like six different malts that go into a beer. We just call, when all those six malts are mixed up together, we call that the grist. Um, and that's what we mean by the grist. So. And now, I'm going to start to talk about um, this liquid that's currently making in there. We're not going to wait all night for it because we just don't have the time. So we set up a few of these samples earlier. And um, this liquid, as you can see in this one, this was taken off the boil. So this is called wort what is getting made inside this mash tin at the moment and you can see it's you know it's not a very nice looking liquid and you'll start to see at the bottom there you'll see all the trub falling and that's all the proteins and everything that's all forming within there um as i said it's not gonna it's just a sweet liquid at this point it's converted all its starches into sugars and it's ready to be boiled now obviously we're not at that point now, but what I'm gonna to start to do is start to show you the liquid that will come out of this now. So I'm just gonna move a couple of things around. Well, first of all, you're doing that, how do we uh, decide on the flavors and the different sort of styles and flavors for our beers? Um, it depends what we're after. If we were always gonna brew, so if we were talking more about stay pack, so um, we'd use a lot more darker malt. So you, we kind of work backwards, basically. You, you, I always work out in my head um, what is it you want to be drinking and what is it you want to be tasting, just like cooking. So you use those ingredients there to kind of match that up. Do we want that beer to be roasty? Do we want it to be uh, dry or sweet? So you can, you know what certain ingredients do. It's all about knowing your ingredients, just like cooking and knowing what that ingredient does to your end product. So if you work backwards like that, you always, you, you get out of it what you're looking for. Um, it's like when we design recipes, when you know I design stay puffed and things, always work backwards. Same with Club Tropicana. Find, work out first in your head what it is you want to be drinking. Super important. And um, yeah, cool. Right, so again, this is a little bit too early for what I'm doing here. Um, we're not actually going to be using this, this liquid, um, because it's pointless. It's just there for show. And it's, um, there. So what we're going to start doing now is taking the liquid off, the wort. It's, it's now called wort. We're not going to sparge that and I'll show you why now. So it is a little bit early. So as you can see, that liquid coming out of there, uh, I'm just going to get a little bit of a glass. So this will kind of be high strength now. Um, it's going to be full of sugar. The density is going to be very big. So you can see the color of it there and what it's looking like. Um, the, the full conversion hasn't probably taken place, but we're not after that at this point, to be totally honest, because it's not what we're doing tonight. So what we usually do at this point now, when we start draining off, we start to put more water over the top. And it's called sparging. So you basically shower the grain. And again, it, it, you're taking out more of that you know, those sugars and those flavors that we're after. But probably what's most important is that to stop this enzymic reaction occurring, we have to put hotter, water, hotter liquor onto it, water. Um, so we heat the water up to about 80 degrees. So we probably at around 78 degrees is that we're rinsing all this lovely grain. Um, and what it does, it kills the enzymic reaction because we don't need it to work anymore. We've converted those sugars we want to kill it and stop it, and that's how we do it. And this process now of draining off the sweet wort can take anything up, sparging up to you know one hour to one and a half hours, depends how strong the beer is, how much malt that we've used, um, and then yeah, it'll get transferred over into the copper, which we'll talk a little bit more about now. So as this liquid, this sweet liquid, is coming out, um, it'll be getting transferred over to the copper. We pump it through an underback basically like a big sort of um, cylinder, and it gets transferred over into our boilers. You can call them boilers, you can call them coppers, there's many different things that you can call them, but we just call them a steam, just a boiler basically. And what happens is that as that's transferring, we'll start heating this liquid up, because we need to boil this wort up. One, to stabilize it, two, to, to stabilize it, and we also need to be adding hops. 
So, as this carries on going, this is one we made earlier. So this is our boiler. And this is a, we took this wort earlier off a Club Tropicana that we were brewing. Alex was actually brewing it, I think, or Ollie, I can't, I can't remember. But um, they kindly let me take some, some of the wort off after the mash tun. And as you can see, it's got that boiling now. And having a rolling boil is super important because you need that vigorous boil. Because we look for it, sort of evaporation rates of around, you know, six to 10%. A good hard rolling boil is what you need to, to get what you need to break down those proteins to get the reactions that we're looking for and this process can take up to 60 minutes 90 minutes depends on what we're doing when we brew our lagers our lazy boy we always um, we always always boil for a lot longer because it's so important to get rid of any off flavors and things like that so at this point now, this has been boiling up for the last sort of 30, 45 minutes or so. I'm not going to let it boil for 60 minutes or 90 minutes because you're probably going to get very, very bored of it. Now, this is where we, st we start to add the hops. Now, always think of the malt. And the malt will always give you your sort of base flavours, your bready flavours, your roasty flavours, uh, your caramel flavours. Um, that's your base flavours. But what the hops give you is your, your more floral flavours, your, your citrus, uh, your fruity flavours, your earthy flavours, spicy, depending on what hops you use, they do different things. So we're going to add some hops now. But one of the first things, I mean, very rare, a lot of the beers that we make, they're not very bitter because we're not after bitterness. We don't make bitter beers. Um, it's not what we want. We like very well balanced beers. So we add very little hops at the beginning. So you always add the hops at the beginning to get more bitterness. So we had a very, very small amount of hops at the beginning. The real sort of big additions come towards the end, so you pick up the less bitterness. But as you can imagine, you want to keep all those flavors locked in, all these lovely oils that are in, inside these hops. So we always add at around sort of, I'd say kind of flame up, the last five minutes of the boil, that's when we'll start to add the hops. Now, there's also something else that we add, um, it's very, very important, is, Kettle finings. Um, some people, home brewers, like to call it Irish moss. Some like to call it protoflock. Um, there's many different things, but what this does is it binds together all the proteins that are in there. Because this beer is full of proteins now, as you can imagine. Um, and it creates a haze problem. So using a little bit of Irish moss, you've got a couple of grams in there, maybe one gram. Uh, we'll use a lot more on our kit. We'll always add this, the, the sort of last 10 minutes into the boil. And it really does help settle out any of these proteins that I'm talking about. Because we don't want beer that's very, very, very hazy at package. Because you can't reverse that, 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 that sort of protein. Um, so then we'll start looking at the hops. So again, depends how many hops, depends what you're brewing. All depends on how many hops that you're looking for. Um, if you want an IPA, then you're going to be using, you know, quite heavy, um, you know, some, some heavy hops, some American hops, citrus, mosaic, those sort of, you know, Simcoe's. If it's a British, you know, if it's a sort of uh, traditional beer, then you're not going to use so much. But um, I haven't weighed these out, but this is where the hops will get added in. You'll start to see them dispersing straight away. So we're using pellets today. You don't have to use pellets. You can use leaf. Um, I've not got any leaf here, so... We're going with the pellets today. And as you can see now, and you, th th that smell hits you straight away. It really, really does. So, yeah, so what point of the boil do you add the, uh, the hops in? Do you add it right to the start or do you add it to Yeah, the so basically, you can add a little bit of hops at the start. Depends what you're after. There's a way, um, there's calculators out there that can calculate the bitterness for you. So in our brewery, we had around 200 grams at the start of the boil, which is really insignificant. And the real, like, the, the, why we add such a small amount of hops at the beginning is that we don't want to pick the bitterness up, but adding hops does break the surface tension. So we don't get boil overs, uh, you're breaking that surface tension, there's something in there, um, stop it fo you know, foaming over and fobbing over. It's not till right at the end, the last sort of five minutes um, before the boil finishes, um, sometimes it's on, it's on zero minutes, we'll knock the boiler off, um, then we'll add the hops because we really want to keep those flavors locked in and that bitterness level is quite low because we're using so many, you know, so many hops in these IPAs and pe sort of American pale ales. You don't want uh, too much bitterness because it just ruins the beer. So your timing of your hops almost lends itself to the style or flavor that you want. hundred percent, yeah. If, you, if, if we were brewing a, um, a sort of imperial stay pups, which um, we've brewed, a, 
a few Imperial State Puffs recently because we've got some um, some new four packs coming up very very soon. Again, we release more information on that. Um, that's going to be really cool. So with those big sweet Imperial Stay Puffs, we want a bit of bitterness because you don't want it too sweet. So what counteracts sweetness is bitterness. So you bring the bitterness up by adding more hops at the beginning. So again, it, it all depends on what you want in that beer. So as I said, you work backwards and then you can work your recipe up by obviously working backwards and that's what we always do. So, so um, like your hops lend itself to different styles, are the finings universal? Or do they sort of have characteristics? No, finings, well, that's a good question. Um, I, I think for any home brewers, yeah, finings should stay uh, universal. I think if you're after a beer that you really want that cloudiness and you really don't want your yeast to be dropping in it, and you want to do your New England IPAs and things like that, then just don't put it in. If you don't mind cloudy beer, don't put it in. You don't have to put it in. Um, it just helps clear the beer further down the line. Um, so this, th there's a couple of beers that we don't put it in on, and that would be like um, our Dutty, our, uh, our Vermont IPA, very, very heavily hot, and we want to keep that real thick cloudiness in there. So we won't use finings on that beer. So that's a good question, but generally, yeah, you can. So, I mean, do you want to come and have a look at this now and see what the hops are doing? You can see it's kind of turned a green colour. And that's all those lovely oils kind of like all mixed up. And it smells awesome. It really does. And I'm going to turn this off now. Because it doesn't need to um, carry on anymore. So, perfect. I'll put the lid back on. So once this process is done, this... The wort is all boiled up, you've got your hops in there, um, you're happy with it, you've had a good boil, you've done everything that you need to do. We then got to cool this liquid down because if you try to add a yeast to the boiling liquid, it's going to kill it. So how we do that is I'll show you what we use as a homebrew. And this is, I mean, all this kit that you're looking at now, I mean, we were brewing on this 10 years ago uh, in the garage, me and Brad, every weekend we'd be in there trying different things and bottling. I brew on a Saturday, um, maybe do a bit of bottling. Brad would then come in on a Sunday and do his brewing. We spent two years doing all this R&D on this kit before we launched uh, the business. And you know, one of the beers that Kutch, uh, which won Chapman Beer of Britain back in 2015, that was actually designed and brewed on this system. So we've still got it and we still use it for a few things now and it's just really cool. So I'm just gonna turn this off. Now, as a home brewer, cooling this liquid down can be a right pain, an absolute pain in, a, in, in, in the butt. Um, because, you know, at home we don't have plate heat exchangers, we don't have these things. Uh, some people like to, I can always remember, I put it into these plastic buckets and put it into my, um, into my um, bathtub and put my bathtub full of ice and cold water. Um, and my girlfriend used to go absolutely nuts. But, because um, it takes like about, I don't know, like six to eight hours for this liquid to cool down. So we built this little contraption. Um, we just literally went and bought a load of pipe, um, wrapped it around a, a sort of uh, a, a sort of bucket, um, and come up with this sort of really weird contraption. But it works really, really, really well. So what happens is that we put it inside. I'm not going to hook it up totally now. But what we would do, it sit inside this uh, very, very hot wort. Um, we put cold water on a hose pipe onto there and then we put a bit of hose pipe to the floor down to the drain and we pump in cold water and what would happen is that it'd go round the spiral, the pipe and it would really cool down it, within 30 minutes we'd cool the, the, the hot work down to around 20 degrees um, which was really important, so like 18 degrees, 20 degrees because that was super important, absolutely massive so once that was done and that liquid is all cooled down where it needs to be, we then start taking it off and obviously very very careful because it will spick out a little bit. So, so from your experience with cooling gas, does uh, the, the cooling time sort of affect the beer in any way? Sort of uh, cooling it too yeah, quick it, or too slow? It, it is important, I mean it's not critical but you want to chill it down as fast as you can. I mean you don't really want to wait overnight anyway because it just takes more time up. So, the quicker you can chill it, um, chill it down, yeah, it's better. But it's not critical, you know, people can't do that. You know, it, it's not gonna give any off flavors. Uh, I think the most important thing is that you wanna get your yeast in the, into that liquid as soon as possible, 
stop any bacterial infections. If you keep all your sort of hygiene levels right and you're cleaning everything and your buckets are all sterilized, then you're not going to have a problem if it cools down overnight, in all, in all honesty, or in all, to be fair. So this will keep coming now, and as you can see there, it's quite a dark color. It is quite, a, it smells awesome and it does really, you really get that sort of um, malt sort of uh, aromas from it. Just like you would a, a sort of, um, what is it, not Horlicks, what's the other one? Uh, Maltesers. It smells like the, the sort of, the middle of Maltesers, but um, great. So this sort of part of the stage seems sort of relatively quick. So why do some beers take up to like three weeks to make? Yeah, so I mean, brewing a beer takes a day. So best part of you know six hours there's a lot of waiting around but brewers don't sort of stand around with their hands in their pockets I mean we got a few that do but um, no we don't um, there's a lot of cleaning you you've not seen me clean much because um, I, I cleaned it all earlier or, or some of the lads did I didn't um, so in between while waiting for the mash tun they're off doing their checks they're cleaning the you know the fermenters ready for the beer to fill um, there's a lot of clean, you know, 70% of brewing is cleaning, so it's not as glamorous as it, as, as it sounds um, because hygiene is so important. It's not like we're making 40% proof gin or anything like that. We're making, you know, low ABV, you know, sort of 5, 4% and um, hygiene is so critical, so yeah. So you mentioned keeping the, uh, the beers sort of sterile. What sort of precautions do, you know, do we take with the beer to make sure it's all sterile in between these stages? Yeah, so we obviously, we use cleaners and sanitizers. So we'll always wash, um, we'll pre-rinse things. Then we'll clean with sort of caustic chemicals that will get rid of all that debris um, and actually clean the tanks or whatever, whatever it is we're cleaning. Uh, we call it CIP or cleaning process systems. But if I, if I was doing it on a home brew, um, I, you know, you can buy lots of different things, Star San, um, lots of different detergents from any homebrew shops at the Malt Miller. Um, and it's just basically scrubbing. You scrub, you clean it out. Um, it's not glamorous, like I said. Then you rinse it out. And then the next stage is sterilizing. Because cleaning and sterilizing are completely different things. So, you can, again, you, you can buy universal sort of sterilizers. We've got one, um, we use this, which is an alcohol-based um, spray so it's basically once it's clean and once it's rinsed because it has to be rinsed you know you, you just spray on your sort of sterilizer and what this does this is this is a, an alcoholic sterilizer you can get it from any home brew shop as well that's when it starts to sterilize just like you do it all with all your hands now um, so that's super important now once this is done you've got this now becomes your fermenter this liquid in here should be cooled down um, it's now your fermenter. Now this is where you add your yeast. So this is our yeast here, and, it, uh, and this is a sample that I, I took earlier. So we use our own house yeast, and you can get, you know, like a lot of home brewers would like to use dry yeast. Nothing wrong with dry yeast. They're very, very good. Um, they're easy to handle. They, 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 they store well. But obviously, because we're brewing beer every day, we wouldn't want to be using dry yeast because it's very expensive for what it is. Um, so we reuse our yeast and we've got our own yeast culture that we've had for the last eight years. Um, it's grown within our brewery, settles in, it's our own unique strain, nobody else has this, it's, it's ours and it's um, top secret. So um, this is where you would add them to the actual wort and I'll show you now. So if I mix that up and you'll see it and it's, it is a different yeast to what you would make bread. I would not get... Um, um, I would not try using bread yeast uh, to make beer. They're two completely different things. So, so do cool. different yeast strains add different characteristics to the beers? Yeah, massively. So if you, th if you were to think of a, um, a German wheat beer and an IPA, and a, and a, a, a sort of Amer um, an American style IPA like Club Tropica. Now in our Club Tropica, we would use, um, which is, an, which is a, a, a sort of tropical IPA, we would use a classic English strain yeast, so it's very clean, um, slight esters would come from it, a little bit of fruitiness, um, not that you would notice that much in an IPA. Um, but if you were to use or to drink a German wheat beer, you'll get those banana flavours, those uh, clove, uh, phenolic flavours, all that is derived from the yeast. 
So the yeast is, gives off these different flavors in the German wheat beer. So yeah, certain beers need certain, um, certain yeasts, exactly. But you can get them in dry formats for home brewing as well. You can get the Munich style yeasts, you can get Bavarian style yeasts. Um, it's, you know, the, the selection is huge. So, yeah. Do we sort of mix yeast at all or make a little bit of a cocktail? Like no, we yeast, have. We have yeast? done, um, so on our seventh birthday pack, we did a Belgian strong ale. And we actually used three different Belgian yeasts. And we, we used a sort of monastery yeast, a Trappist yeast, and I can't remember the other one. But we blended them together. We grew the yeast up within a starter, within our tank. Um, so it takes on a, a sort of unique format, basically. And then we use that in the beer. And it gives a really different sort of um, outlook on the beer and a different aspect to it. So it's, it's fun. Yeah, you can, but of course you can. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Cool. And then a question here saying, do you still homebrew or just play with all the big toys? Um, I still homebrew, um, not beer so much anymore. So, like, I take a bit of a kick from going, like, so, sort of back to these books. So, this book, um, First Steps in Winemaking. So, I'll make a lot of my own wines and things like that. Um, Limoncello, I'll have a go at. And it's so easy to do at home and it's a bit of fun. Um, especially at Christmas time, I'll always make my own uh, Irish cream, also known as Bailey's, Advocat and things like that. And yeah, and I like going out and kind of picking my own fruits off the trees, whether they're kind of like damsons, plums, uh, blackberries and things like that. And you can make your own sort of drinks from, um, from that. So yeah, I do, because it's a, it's a hobby and that's what it always was. And it still is. Um, so yeah, enjoy it. So once we're ready, and we're ready for that yeast to go into the chill down wort um, to start the fermentation. Now we've got all those lovely sugars um, that we need to turn into alcohol. So what this yeast does is that it starts to eat all those lovely sugars and it starts to reproduce and grow more yeast and grow more yeast um, and they give birth to more yeast. But what happens as a byproduct, they eat, they eat all the sugars and they give out CO2. We're not really interested in the carbon dioxide at this, this moment, it just comes out of the tanks. Um, but the other part is that it makes alcohol, and that's what we're really, really, really keen on. Um, so, I can't see that. I'm getting messages from the back here. So what we've got here is beers fermenting. So this is a sample that we took earlier. So this has come out of one of our tanks, and it's actually on day two of ferment. Uh, this is actually Club Tropicana, and it's probably half the way through its ferment. So what you can see in the bottom of there, you can see the yeast. And I, I don't know how good a thing you can see it. It's still all moving around. You see how cloudy it is. Um, and that is a beer actively in ferment now. So all those lovely sugars um, are getting eaten up by the yeast, turned into alcohol. Now this is probably around, I'd say currently, maybe about three and a half, four percent. Um, in a couple of days time, it'd end up at, at sort of 5.5, 5.6% uh, proof. Now you can see the two different colors, or oh, maybe not there. So as I said earlier, we have the two colours there. This is the word before the yeast goes in and be before it was boiled up, and then this is the beer fermenting. Now as the beer is fermenting, this can take anything up to about um, five days, as, 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 as low as three days. Um, could be up to two weeks if it's a lager, depending on what it is. Depends how strong the beer is as well. Um, yeah, so that process can happen. Now, the next step after this, um, again involves hops because we don't use just hops in the boil we do a lot of dry hopping so what a lot what the dry hops do is give it a lot more aroma uh, it'll give it flavor as well but it's primarily used for, for aromas and we do this yeah sorry just got a customer <laughs> and this is what happens with dry hops so we'll add once this beer is fermented, we'll start adding more hops into this. And um, as you can see, what happens there, I've added a lot more hops into this, in all honesty. And, um, but you can basically get the gist of it, you can zoom onto the middle there. And it's basically, you're getting all these hops infused into the beer to get that. And that, you know, this process will we'll, we'll cool the beer down to around 16 degrees after it's finished fermenting. So it's still fairly warm, it's a, it, we call it the cooling period, and that's where we'll add these hops 
And what we'll do every day, our cellar guys will come in um, who, who look after the beer after it's brewed. Um, take up to two weeks. So what they'll start doing then is they'll start bumping it with, um, with nitrogen or carbon dioxide to mix up all these hops. Because what happens is that they'll sit at the bottom. Sometimes they'll sit at the top, sometimes they'll sit at the bottom. Depends what beer it is, what hop it is. Um, and you mix that up. So you shoot air up through the bottom of the fermenter and you mix it up. Um, I always call it just like a tea bag. Um, you wouldn't have a cup of tea and not stir the tea bag. So it's exactly the same with the beer. And again, for home brewers, um, it's exactly the same. You'll add the hops in the same way, but just carefully use a big spoon um, to slowly kind of do that. Now, if home brewers are a bit concerned about getting oxygen in beer, because oxygen in beer is bad, um, is you can add the hops just before it finishes fermenting. And now you measure the fermentation by using hydrometers. Um, they just basically measure the density of a liquid with the amount of sugar that's left in it. Because every day the sugar comes down and down and down and down. And your glass hydrometer will bob in the top and it'll tell you how much sugar is left. So you know exactly where you are. So you can add a little bit of um, hops in before it finishes fermenting. Because what will happen is that any oxygen that's added into that liquid then, into that beer, gets eaten up by the yeast. Because it's still active and still fermenting. So. So once this is all dry hot, um, we're happy with the flavours that we got out of it. Um, we then need to start getting all this hops and gunk out of it because you don't want a beer that looks like that, basically. Um, it's full of hops, it's full of yeast. We then need to start getting rid of it. And the, how we do that is that we chill the beer down. You know, we're chilling the beer down to around um, sort of zero degrees. Um, again, you can do it in your home, in, in your sort of bucket. You can put it in the fridge, put it in, a, in the shed outside at night and things, um, if you don't have a fridge big enough. And that process then takes around about a week. For our lagers, we'll go up to about three, four weeks, because it needs longer to sort of mature, um, to get those, cre those sort of clean, crisp flavors that you'll get within Lazy Boy. And you'll start to end up with a beer, starting to look like this. The longer you chill it for, the, the, the more you can chill and mature a beer, the better. Um, time is the best thing for that. And this is what you end up with. So this will be our, our sort of lazy boy that we will um, we'll have it chilling down for around three to four weeks. Um, and it's ready when it's ready. You know, it's, um, I think with lager, it's, uh, you can't rush it because if you do rush it, people will tell straight away. So it's super important that you don't rush you sort of, you know, your maturation. And that's why I said earlier, patience is, is the key with brewing and waiting for it to ferment away. And, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's painstaking because you want to try it. You want to, um, yeah, you just want to get into it basically. But um, any more questions there, Alex? Yeah, how long do we leave the dry hops in for? So, good question. So we'll, we'll usually dry hop, um, say on day one um, of cooling. Then we'll wait two days. Then what we'll start to do is start to bump those tanks, um, or give, if you're a home brewer, start to give them a stir. So that dry hopping process can usually take around five days, depending on how many hops are put in. If it was a standard IPA, anything from four to five days dry hopping. Um, if it was a sort of double IPA or something really big, like a, a sort of um, a, a Vermont IPA, it can take up to 10 days, because you're adding different, um, you're adding hops at different sort of intervals and stages. So there's many different ways you can do it. Now, one of the biggest parts of, of, of cellaring and our cellaring team will actually look after the beer after it's brewed, is that we'll taste test every day. You can taste test your homebrew every day as well. And you know, it's ready when it's ready. So you, you wouldn't really want to put a time limit on it. Keep tasting it, you know, um, sensory testing is, 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 is super important. Because once that beer is ready and up to spec, through, you know, to trying it and sampling it, that's when it's ready. But that can take anything from four days up to around sort of 10 days, depending on the beer, so, yeah. Cool, so, so what temperature do we uh, chill the beer down to, and is it possible to over chill a beer? Um, we take our beers down to around zero degrees. Now, they're not gonna freeze if it goes to like minus two. If the beer is kind of like 5% proof or, you know, 4% and up, you're not really gonna freeze that beer. Maybe, you will freeze it if you put it in a freezer at sort of minus 20, 
but you can go as low as minus two, something like that. You couldn't on our club, um, our club Tropica non-alcoholic, because the, the alcohol is so low in it, 0.5, if you put it down at sort of minus two, it's gonna freeze up. So generally, sort of mid-range beers and up, you can take down to sort of minus two, not a problem. We take ours up to zero degrees. By the time they get over to packaging, you probably, they can reach minus one, you know, sometimes like that. Um, you know, getting the beer as cold as possible is, 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 is important, but it's not, it's not, um, it's not going to cause you any massive problems on a homebrew scale if you can't get down to sort of zero degrees. Five degrees, if you can get a five degrees, you're winning. So, so uh, do you take the beer off the yeast before or during, you know, when you're dry hopping? Mm -hmm. Good question. So, yes, we take the yeast off because we reuse the yeast. So what we'll do is that we'll put the beer on to cool and then we'll turn the cone. So in the cone section, right down in there, we call that the cone section of our fermenter, we have cooling plates. And we'll turn them on to make the yeast flock out a little bit quicker and a little bit more solid. Then after a couple of days, we'll take off that yeast um, because we don't want to be chucking the yeast back around into the beer. We want to take it off nice and healthy, um, ready for the next brew. So it's looking like this. I mean, this yeast come off today um, and it's looking dead fresh, uh, ready for the next one. So, and you don't want much hops within this yeast. You don't want hardly any hops at all within it. Um, very important. So yes, we take the yeast off. If, if I were to do it on a home brew, what I would do is wait for the beer to nearly finish fermenting and I'd siphon it off one bucket into a clean sterile bucket and then dry hop in that one. So you're not mixing up all the old yeast again. You can if you want because you're not reusing the yeast. But just out of practice, I always used to take it from one bucket, transfer it over to a tube and pipe to the next bucket to, do your, to start your dry hopping. It's a little bit more work but I, I used to find you get a better sort of cleaner flavour from it. So you mentioned that we've got our, our house yeast strain, but within the rest of our core range, do we use many other yeast strains at all to achieve the different yeah, sort of styles so of beers? We've got our own house lager strain um, that we've had for the last couple of years. Um, we've, if we were to do, sometimes when we do sort of New England IPAs, one-offs, like in our eighth birthday pack, the Paradise City, what we've done with that is that we used a dry yeast um, called Windsor, and what it, that does is that it doesn't ferment the beer as much as our, our, our normal house yeast. What it, it, it leaves more sugar into the beer, so a, a sort of fuller body. So yeah, we, we do use many different yeasts depending on you know what that beer is. So, so coming from like a, a small homebrew kit, uh, you know, one of this sort of capacity and size. What's the main differences and challenges that you found from you know scaling up? I think, I mean, the process is very similar to what we've seen today. I mean, I've shown a real, you know, cut down version um, of what a brew, you know, entails a, a sort of home brew. But the process that I've talked about is what we do on the main kit. There's no, there's not much difference. It's just obviously bigger equipment. Um, there's more automation, you know, to make life a lot easier for ourselves. Um, yeah, and it, it, it was quite daunting when we first started, but you know, we started on a sort of 1,000 litre kit um, and worked our way up. But it was super important for us to spend two years in a garage sort of grafting away, me and Brad, doing all these different recipes and things like that. And I can always remember, I think we brewed over 200 different beers on, on, on this kit to make sure we're getting things right. Um, most of those beers went down the drain, but um, yeah, but you learn from that. I mean, you learn from you learn from your mistakes or you know when you're finding out what certain ingredients do uh, you know trying to combine them um, and then you just work your way up you know you don't get too daunted by I'm jump up too quick we, we spent two years really seriously homebrewing before we took the plunge um, we used to I can always remember we used to go um, and book brewer there was a few breweries around you can go and do a, like a brewery experience day so we'd go around these different breweries as, as home brewers, no, we were, we were going to set our own sort of brewery up, um, and we'd use it, you know, as a big learning tool going into these small breweries on sort of bigger scales, um, and just trying to pick things up from there, and, um, speaking to a lot of people and things. It, it was daunting, but we took our time and made sure what we were doing was right. So.
So how do we sort of achieve the flavors in, you know, like for instance, behind you, the shakedown, how do you achieve those mango flavors that are in there? Well, shakedown is a big one for us. It's actually one that we're having tomorrow. So um, it's not on the, uh, the shop yet. It, it kind of ran out um, a couple of weeks ago, I think. We're doing this one. Um, it's getting canned up. Uh, I think it got canned today, to be, to be totally honest. Um, and this will be going online tomorrow. So a mango Vermont, we add a lot of fruit to certain types of beer. So things like peaches and cream, um, frambuzi, which is our sour. We get loads of raspberries. So as the beer is fermenting, just like this, as it's at this stage, and it starts getting towards the end of fermentation, that's when we'll start adding a lot more sort of um, um, fruits and things like that. So for shakedown, uh, we'll add the mango. So we add mango puree right towards the end. And we don't want to add it too soon because what happens is that that CO2 that's produced for the yeast might scrub off a lot of those lovely mango flavors that we're after. So, you know, last week on the, on the shakedown, we had the mango puree come in uh, and the guys were putting in the mango um, probably about last week now. So, but the beer is all ready to be chilled and it's, 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 it's been canned. Um, I think it was canned today and it'll be online tomorrow. So that's a, that's a good one, yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Yes, do we use sort of like any uh, like automation or machinery um, or do we do you know, everything still by hand? Yeah, it's, we've got a very traditional brewery. It's not a fully automated brewery. It's still, I still sort of class it as craft. You know, we don't have brewers that sit down and press buttons and you know, let you know, the PLCs and computers kind of do everything. Our brewing is, is still a, you know, very much a manual um, system. The guys will be digging out the mash tuns. We do have discharge arms to help the, the green come out. But we really, really rely on our brewers and our consistency. Just like you would a home brewer. You rely on the, you know, the, the, the skill of the home brewer. We rely, and consistency is so important within, you know, um, within brewing. It's probably the number one is consistency. Because you want that same product consistent over and over and over. And so we rely on our brewers. So our brewers are very skilled. You know, they have to keep hitting those right targets those white specs and everything like that, super important. Um, we had a question earlier as well, I'm going to go back to this book, and um, this was actually my granddad's, like I said earlier, and you know, some of the recipes that we were looking at, um, it, it, you know, it, it's so funny, and um, there's a recipe in the back of here called Cock Ale. Um, it's a hundred year old recipe, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure we're going to make this beer, but um, <laughs> But it's a hundred year old recipe called cock ale. Um, so you have to take 10 gallons of ale and a large cock. Um, the older the better. Parboil the cock and flay him and stamp him in a stone mortar until his bones are broken. I mean, it's absolutely random. I, mean, I don't know why you do um, a beer like that. But um, not that I've ever tried. But um, it's just fun. And like I said, it is about home brewing. And you, know, you don't have to be a scientist to home brew. You can do it in many different ways and it's all about having fun at the end of the day. When I started kind of seriously when I was about 21, um, it's, you know, it's, it used to be looked at as an old man's thing. It's not, it's not, because you can make all your own recipes, whether you want to do a recipe like that, you can do it. And it's, it's fun and it's, you know, there's a lot of science involved in it. Um, I used to brew too much that I could actually drink. I'm not a big drinker and um, so I ended up giving a lot away and when me and Brad, the, brewing in the garage, we'd give away so many different samples to people, or family and friends, and they'd get sick and tired of, um, of trying all the different beers. So. so when you were brewing in the garage, how did you uh, achieve carbonation when you uh, finished up your product? Yeah, so what we do is that we, again, once that beer had sort of finished fermenting, um, and we were ready to, to bottle it, because we used to bottle everything, that would probably, as a home brewer, bottling was probably the easiest bit. Um, it was the most painstaking, but it was a fairly easy process. So what we would do, um, what I would personally do, I'd measure the amount of beer we had. So if we had 15 litres of beer ready to be bottled, um, you add sugar, more sugar to that beer. Because remember what I said earlier, sugar and yeast. Um, the yeast eats the sugar, creates CO2, and it creates alcohol. We're not really interested in the alcohol at this point, at, at, at bottling. We're interested in the CO2, because that's what carbonates the beer. So I'd mix in, I'd usually go around three and a half grams per litre, going back to my homebrew days, maybe four grams per litre of beer. I'd mix, carefully mix the sugar in, very, very carefully, because I wouldn't want to get oxygen in it. Um, once all that was dissolved then, within the beer, uh, I'd bottle it. So I'd get a little siphon, a little pipe, 
into the bottles, cap it, cap all the bottles, and then I put those bottles in a warm room, a dark, warm room. Because what you want to happen then is the little bits of yeast that are left in the beer to start waking back up and thinking, damn, there's more sugar to eat. I'm going to eat this sugar and make carbon dioxide. Um, and the carbon dioxide is stuck within that bottle. It can't go anywhere. So it's stuck within the bottle and it carbonates the beer. So um, that was how we used to do it as, as home brewers. So it's kind of called bottle conditioning. People matter you about bottle conditioning beers. You can still buy bottle conditioned beers in the supermarket. Uh, we don't bottle condition, we don't can condition here. Um, we do it in a more um, safer format about um, yeah, we add carbon dioxide into the beer and we measure it right to the, you know, the right levels. We've got machines that can get it right pinpoint to make sure that the, that, that consistency is there every single time. So. so when you were home brewing, what sort of mistake led to your biggest lesson learned? Um, one of the first recipes that I've ever done, um, it's, it, 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 it's, it's on show, I think we showed it last week, and I called it Tits Up, and it was like a, a traditional British ale. It was, it was one of my first all green brews, and I, I called it Tits Up because when I was actually making the beer, it was a complete nightmare. The mash tin blocked, um, I think I spilled a load of it. Um, it, was, it was a complete nightmare of a day, it was my first ever time, and that's why I called it Tits Up. Um, but the beer ended up tasting really, really, really good. I can remember inviting my dad over um, over to my old house and he came over and we had a bit of a session on it actually and it was um, but it was great. So you learn di you know different things, you know. We're not perfect now. People always make mistakes, brewers will make mistakes. It's about how it's about what you do to rectify those mistakes and make sure that they don't happen again. But probably, you know, as home brewing, that's the fun in it. But yeah, the tits up one was the, the biggest one. It was actually a nice beer, so so for, for home brewing, obviously we brew on like a, a much bigger scale. Um, you know, how do you work out your, your yeast quantities to put into, into smaller quantities of, uh, of beer? We scale down. It's all about scaling down. I mean, home brewing, um, to get a real good home brew is quite, it is difficult because you're talking about much smaller quantities. You know, you could be talking about five kilos of grain going into a home brew, where we use 1,000 kilos of grain. So, you know, getting it right at home brew is very difficult because you're talking about smaller quantities. Um, so, for example, if, if we were to use, let's say we pitched yeast into one of our big tanks and we put in 20 litres of yeast. If we were to only brew um, 20 litres of beer as opposed to 5,000 litres of beer, you can just work that out, you know, um, 5,000 divided by 20. There's your multiplier, and then you multiply that with yeast, you know, 20 kg of yeast divided by that multiplier will give you your, your sort of quantity ready for your home brew. So it's just scaling back. So are we likely to, uh, to bring tits up back, or can we share it with, uh, with our first time know, brewers? It was quite a traditional beer, it was like a, it was a kind of um, a, an English strong ale, so um, I'm not sure what um, that kind of core fans would think about that, but I'd love to personally. <laughs> So is there any sort of like specific styles that you enjoy brewing personally? I think if we talk to any brewer, um, I think they, they always enjoy brewing the dark stouts and things like that. One, because obviously the smell is absolutely amazing. The roasty smells you get from it, the coffee, chocolate smells. Um, there's something about brewing a stout that's just different to brewing sort of pain ales and IPAs. I think one of the other reasons is, is that we don't get to brew stouts or imperial stouts like the new state pups we got coming out. Um, they were brewing them the last couple of days actually and um, the place just smelled amazing. Um, because you don't get to brew them often, I think that adds the extra bit of sort of specialness to it. Yeah, I'd say stouts. So you're amplified in your, you know, your imperial ABVs, how do we achieve those, uh, those higher ABVs? So again, it's all about quantity. So if we I'll talk about Club Tropica again. So for Club Tropica, we might use 1,000 kilos or one ton of malt to, to hit that 5.5% that we're looking for. Now, if we want to make a 10% beer, we have to use double the malt. So we'd probably be going in, if we want to make a 10% beer, an Imperial Staper, what we do, we double that malt. So instead of using 1,000 kilos for a 5% beer, 5.5, we'd use 2,000 kilos for a 10 11 percent beer so it's all about adding more grain the more grain you have the more sugar 
you'll get within that beer. The more sugar, it'll turn into more alcohol through the yeast as well. But you'll also have to put more yeast in because the yeast, uh, will, you know, there's a huge amount of sugar there to be eaten. So you have to up your yeast rates as well. It's super important. Um, so yeah. So any more questions? Um, people are just wondering if we can sort of share some basic recipes. Ooh. Um, you know, maybe, maybe tits up if, if we got no future plans to, to share. Yeah, we could do. Um, I mean, we're, we're always pretty open with our recipes, you know, with our hops. Um, I mean, you know, malt builds really, like, you know, the, the sort of malt builds, you know, club tropical and things like that. You know, you've got your pale malt, um, which is the majority of it. You may have a little bit of wheat in there. You might have a little bit of sort of caramel just to give it a bit of maltiness. Um, but it really, those sort of beers come down to the hops, because it's the hops that actually make that beer kind of sing. You, you know, you want those tropical flavors, you're not gonna get tropical flavors from malt. So the sort of hops that we're using, so I think from Tropica, you know, like, you know, Simcoe, Mosaic, um, again, sort of easy living, we look at Citra within there. So I think what we're gonna do is, um, we talked about it this week, is maybe releasing a couple of recipes out there. I mean, let us know what sort of recipes that you'd like to, um, um, but yeah, yeah. So we will be sharing those sort of recipes. I think a couple of years ago we shared an old, uh, an old recipe for hot box. Um, that was a beer that me and Brad kind of made, and it was a, a smoked IPA. Um, I loved it. It was it was like frazzles, it was crisp like frazzles, but it was quite fruity as well. We shared that recipe online. Um, so in the next sort of seven days we'll probably release another couple of recipes if you know people are interested. We usually get a lot of people email in and ask, you know, how we brew this and how do we do kutch and we're always open and honest because it's, I mean, it's no big secret. Um, so yeah, yeah. So in terms of uh, conditioning water at home, you know, would you use tap water or would you opt for, you know, bottled water where, you know, everything's going to be a little bit more pH friendly? Yeah, um, so when I was home brewing, I would get, I, uh, I, I tried everything, bottled water, um, I'd get it from the tap. I think it, 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 I think it depends what stage you're at as a home brewer. If you're just getting into it, don't worry about it. Just don't, don't bog yourself down if you're just getting into home brewing. Just get a few done. It's not going to be perfect, but it doesn't need to be perfect. It's the fun in doing it. Um, but if you, you know, if you get the hook and you really want to get into it, and you, you know, you're progressing, you can send your, your tap water away. There's a company called Murphy and Son up in Nottingham, you know, for 15, 20 quid, send a little bit of water away, they'll analyze it for you, and they'll tell you what you need to put in it to make certain, you know, specific beers. So that's what we did. When we really seriously got into it, we'd get our water sent off to Murphy and Son, um, and they kind of do everything for us. We, it's a little bit different now, we can test our own water, and you know, we, we do all that ourselves, but um, as a home brewer, and they've got it, you know, they cater for home brewers too. They've also got their own website. So it's not like you're asking, you know, you don't have to be professional to get your water tested. So, so do we try and mimic those, uh, those you know, water profiles, like, you know, your, your, your Dublin water for your, for your stouts and then you burn on track? Yeah, waters. 100%. Yeah, it's super important. And we have them from, you know, since day one. Even since we were kind of all green home brewing. Um, and you, won't, you only really need to concentrate on your water for... Um, when you go all green, so when you're using, you know, your, your crushed malts, if you're using your tins and things like that, I wouldn't really worry about it. But when you start getting to this all green stuff, it is so it is important to mimic those styles, and you can switch it up as well. So we were talking lots last week about um, New England IPAs and things like that. Um, we use a stout profile for our water in that beer, in that in that New England pale ale, because we want that New England pale ale to be quite thick, um, very kind of chewy, and on a real nice soft mouthfeel, a full mouthfeel. So, you know, those water treatments are super important, but you can do it like however you want to do it. I mean, that's what it's all about. It's all about experimenting and having fun as a home brewer, because, yeah, why else would you do it? So we've talked about the, uh, the organic flavors, such as you know, your mango and your raspberry, but what about the not so organic flavors, for instance, like the marshmallow in, uh, in Stay Puff? So what we do with our Stay Puff is that we use a lot of lactose, now, lactose is a milk sort of derivative, it's a, and it's a sugar, but it's an unfermentable sugar, so the yeast can't break those chains down. They can't break that, that, that sort of lactose sugar. So we'll put 
a, a, a real heavy amount of lactose within the sort of um, just after the mash then before it goes into the coppers as it's getting transferred so it picks up a lot a lot of sweetness and body now what we'll also do there is that we'll add vanilla so we've used um, we add vanilla to the copper um, so you get the lactose with that sort of sweetness because I mean a, a, a sort of marshmallow flavor what does a marshmallow taste like really it's kind of sweet sweet and creamy isn't it so with the lactose and the vanilla we end up getting that sort of um, different um, that sort of marshmallowy flavor within it but it's 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 when it combines with the roastedness and things that gives it that unique flavor so uh, obviously we mash in you know a few times a day and there's gonna be a lot of a uh, lot of waste product from from that malt what do we uh, what do we do with the, with that so excess malt a lot of the green um, I'll see if we can see in here now and I'll show you what it looks like I didn't drain all of this out but it It'll give a good indication of what it looks like, and we call it spent green. Um, so as you can see now, it's kind of, it's basically, it's like a, a sort of gloopy porridge. Um, all the sugars have come out of it. We've got no need for it anymore. And what we don't want to do is send it to landfill or anything like that. Um, so what it does, it goes back into the, into the food chain. We have a farmer that comes up, um, it takes away something like about 20 ton a week, um, maybe something like that. Um, and it goes in back to the food chain through an accredited um, um, supplier and it goes to the cows. And it all goes to cow's feet. So we're not putting it to landfill. So yeah. Great. Okay, awesome. Well, I think that's about it now. I'm just going to wrap everything up. Um, again, thanks so much. I can't, you know, we're just absolutely overwhelmed with, you know, the stay put cans today it's been absolutely mental i think we're gonna have to get some volunteers in to make sure we can get all the cans out to people now in time so again like i said you know we've raised over thirty thousand pounds for the nhs and um you guys have this is not us it's you guys that have bought them so thanks so much um keep a look out for the imperial ipas as well coming out they should be releasing more on that next week four packs that's going to be super cool um yeah stay safe Thanks very much and um, yeah, cheers.